Hi, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and I've got a real uh, delight to welcome John Rogers from Northwestern, an engineer who is probably uh, the world leader in imaginative, creative sensor development and, uh, and understanding how the human body interacts with sensors and uh, have a real uh, chance to kind of delve into how you got into this field and sure, where you're yeah. taking it. So yeah. welcome, John. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Um, I, I look back at your background and I started to realize that you were a, a genetic recombination of a woman, a, a mother who was a poet and a yeah. father as a geophysicist. Is yeah, that right? yeah, that's right. My dad actually got a PhD in atomic and molecular physics, uh, University of Missouri at Rolla. And so he evolved his career toward geophysics because he got a, a position at uh, Texaco's research lab. So ah. I was born in Rolla, but uh, you know, grew up in, in, in Houston, suburbs of Houston, actually, small, small town. Sugarland or something? Like that? That's right, yeah. Sugarland, Sugar Texas. Yeah, yeah. Sounds pretty good. Sugar yeah, Land. yeah. No. And, and you went to University of Texas at Austin and right. then, what, MIT? Yeah, I was at uh, MIT for six years. Uh, I got master's degrees in, in physics and in chemistry. Uh, and they got a PhD in physical chemistry. So yeah, so you got really a, quite a broad engineering background. Uh, then after that, where were you? What was your next? Uh, well, stop? I won a junior fellowship uh, at Harvard, Harvard Society of Fellows. So it's a bit like a super postdoc. It was a three-year position nominally, but the uh, appeal was that it provided um, you know a salary and a stipend, and you could sort of do whatever you wanted. You weren't linked up with a particular faculty member at, uh, at Harvard. So there was a lot of flexibility with that. I ended up splitting my time between uh, work in a laboratory of a chemist uh, at Harvard, George Whiteside, oh, right. a very famous yeah. materials chemist and uh, uh, entrepreneur. Uh, and the other half of my time I spent um, you know, with a startup company that we launched uh, out of MIT based on my PhD research. So that was a, a really fun time to be able to sort of, you know, balance those, those two opportunities. And uh, I was there for two years from 95 through 97. And you then went to Bell Labs? Went to Bell Labs. So I interviewed at a number of different uh, academic positions, um, opportunities, uh, you know, finishing up at Harvard. And that looked kind of interesting to me. But I was always, um, you know, drawn to the interface between science and technology. And uh, Bell Labs in those days was like, you know, the the Yankees, right, of, of, of science and, and materials and technology and lasers and uh, integrated circuits and so on. And so, so that was by far the, the most attractive place for, for me. And, and I decided to go there and, uh, and spent five years. It was great, great during that time and really was able to expand my, my areas of expertise and get into all new things. Uh, and that kind of Bell Labsian mindset really kind of has, has stayed with me and, and really shaped, you know, the kinds of research programs that we've developed since then. Then after Bell Labs, I think that's the, then, then you went to the uh, University of Illinois Urbana. That's right. Uh, yeah. And then when I learned of you was a famous paper in science in 2011. Yeah. yeah. And this was skin chips. Yeah. This was mm -hmm. the, um, the whole idea of bioelectronics that you have pioneered. Tell a lot for the people who these are the, the medical community, but they may not all be familiar with this. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, right. That, that was an important paper for us. Um, you know, my core expertise is in electronic materials. And so I like to think about the future of electronics as, as a technology. And most people who are uh, doing academic research in electronic materials are thinking about a future of electronics driven by Moore's law. So transistors are getting smaller and smaller, microprocessors that have more and more you know, transistors per unit area at higher and higher clock speeds, more and more sophistication and operation. I think that's a really compelling area for research because to enable a continuation of Moore's law will require a lot of scientific discovery and, and new sort of academic insights in, into materials at, at those scales. Um, but we have been interested in a different future of electronics, not so much driven by the critical dimensions of transistors or their switching speeds or their cost structures, but thinking about electronics as a possible interface to the human body, where you need to consider things around materials level biocompatibility and maybe even more importantly, physical properties that um, enable an intimate integration of integrated circuit technology with the soft textured time dynamic surfaces that you find in biology, 
quite a bit different than anything that's ever been uh, present you know, in commercial forms of integrated circuits, which are all built on the rigid planar surfaces of semiconductor wafers. So the question is, how do you build tissue-like electronics in terms of a soft mechanical modulus and ability to bend and deform and softly laminate uh, against the surfaces of targeted organs? And so this paper was a first demonstration of kind of all the key ideas around the material science, the mechanics designs, the device architectures, the system level considerations that, that allowed us to create skin-like forms of electronics. So in terms amazing. of thickness no, and I mean, yeah, when I, I remember the pictures yeah. uh, from, the, from the paper in science yeah. Yeah. with these little skin chips on the yeah. forehead yeah. for electroencephalogram yeah. yeah, yeah, or the yeah. chest for yeah. a cardiogram. And yeah. saying, this is mind-blowing. Now, yeah. what I don't understand is how did you move from this engineering background with chemistry and physics and everything into I want to get into the body, I want to coalesce chips with the body? What was this that you're, you're known as a bio-inspirational force? Yeah, yeah. well, it's sort of, sort of an interesting story. So we got into this whole area of flexible electronics when I was back at Bell Laboratories. There we were developing new classes of semiconductor materials, polymer, plastic-based electronic materials. And the idea was that if you could create integrated circuits on sheets of plastic, you might be able to build new classes of consumer gadgets. And in particular, we're interested in paper-like flexible displays. And there's a whole you know, interesting set of questions around the materials and how do you pattern them into circuits and what kind of you know, new application opportunities would flow from that kind of technology. Um, and we sort of continued those kinds of programs when uh, I made the transition from Bell Laboratories to uh, mm -hmm. University of Illinois, mm -hmm. but improving the properties of the transistors in those kinds of systems and the functional capabilities and so on. It turns out I was giving a, a talk in electrical engineering at University of Pennsylvania on this topic, large area flexible uh, electronics, and there just so happened to be a few neuroscientists who saw the advertisement, the title for my talk, decided to show up. Oh. And they came up to me after the talk and said, hey, these are cool for you know, large area steerable antennas for the military or flexible displays for consumer applications. Have you ever thought about putting these things on the brain? That would be really interesting, right? Because you could map electrical activity on the brain. And I had never really thought about that bio interface until that, uh -huh. that time. And it just struck me that that, that was a huge opportunity. And so, so we started collaborations uh, on that basis. Uh, we also were uh, interacting with sort of the cardiologist folks at, at uh, University of Pennsylvania's uh, medical school. But, but understanding epilepsy turned out to be uh, a focus area of, of interest, using these sheets as, as diagnostic platforms for doing ECOG measurements at much higher resolution that would be possible just passive arrays of electrodes. So that's one thing. I kind of wanted to go in that direction. But as you probably know, you know, as somebody who's running an academic group, it's ultimately the students who have a large impact on where your research goes. And this was just such a compelling thing for the students. Uh, you know, I think they, they saw a lot greater and higher purpose in working on technologies that could have a positive impact on human health care than technologies that could be used for a new consumer electronics gadget. Uh, yeah, and well, so I and think I, it was those two things that, that came together. Well, you also have a, an incredible force. You have, what, oh, 100 at, at least people in the lab working with you? We've, we've been running a, a pretty large <laughs> group for, for a while, you know, and so I think it's not... <laughs> Just quantity is quality. Oh, you know, no, I, I, really I, I understand, but they, smart, they're, they're kind of electrified and they're yeah. really thinking yeah. about things and yeah. you've pushed them along. Now, and, and you're very humble, too, because I know a lot of, the, where a lot of these ideas do come from, but I, I know some things that you've done since then, which it already was mind-blowing, but then you developed like the Snapchat of chips in the body. Where they, <laughs> Snapchat, with this, I never this, heard it referred to that It would disintegrate. Yeah. I mean, it dissolve, yeah. self, self-destruct, whatever. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, Mr. Phelps, yeah, your, yeah, yeah. your biochip will... What, I mean, it's incredible. And then you had all these yeah. other uh, ideas. I, like you said, you had it on the brain, in the heart, catheters right. with chips. Right. Yeah. You know, so at picking up hydration, picking up, um, you know, things like uh, blood pressure, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You, is there anything you can't measure with these chips? Well, it's a good question. I think most of the sensors that we've focused on up to this point have um, you know, really emphasized physical property measurements, so strains, stresses, electrical potential, um, temperature, things like that. I think the frontier is in biomolecular analysis, right? Biochemical rather than biophysical measurements. And so... But not both? Well, you want to do both. Okay. I think we can do biophysical. You, you name got it. that we down. We could probably do it, yeah. <laughs> I feel pretty comfortable in that realm. And maybe it's just a consequence of my own background and sort of 
physics and you know uh, materials in that sense. But but I think you know being able to sample biofluids and do quantitative analysis of important biomarkers that's the frontier. Well, yeah, for when, us. when you published you know, the science translational medicine yeah, article covered yeah. with the very cool design yeah. sweat sensor yeah. that yeah. did lactate and yeah. electrolytes mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. uh, that obviously was a, a stunner as well, but uh, where can that go? Can that, first of all, do you have to have actual sweat or can you just get it with that right on the skin? Well, a couple of things. So, so right now we're just capturing sweat, sweat that's emerging from the skin in physical liquid form, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so the eccrine glands are acting as pumps to push that sweat into these microfluidic analysis networks. And we can do a lot once we have even sort of microliter volumes of sweat. We can route it around and do all kinds of analysis. But as you know, your body is constantly undergoing sweating. It's insensible sweating, right? right. So it's not enough liquid volume to form well-defined droplets that evaporates almost immediately. And so we think there's a great opportunity for new device designs, new kinds of materials that can capture that insensible sweat. So yes. you don't need to be physically exercising in yeah. order to capture the, this kind of biofluid. But that, that's an area of ongoing research for us. You I think, mean, it's what, tantalizing. You it, think it you'll be able like to it do should, it? It should be possible. I mean, really? if you look at a microscope, your skin, it's constantly, your sweat glands are constantly firing, right? I mean, you can see it. I mean, there, there's liquid there, but it immediately evaporates. So right now we can capture the water vapor associated with insensible sweat. We can condense it in our devices and we thought we had the problem solved, but unfortunately the evaporation process leaves all the biomarkers behind. Well, so you but, end up with the, you know. It's really fascinating though, because if you can do that, that's like the holy yeah. grail yeah, here, yeah, because yeah. then yeah. all these things correlate so well with what's in the yeah. blood, yeah. what's in the mm -hmm. body. Mm -hmm. So that will be a big one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the one of the things that, since you of course moved to Northwestern just a year ago and um, what I learned just uh, from today is that you've taken these chips. They're no longer, you know, f uh, fascinating uh, uh, engineering breakthroughs. They're now in infants. They're in kids. Right. They're in intensive care units. Right. Tell us about that. Right. I mean, I think that was one of the primary motivations in moving from University of Illinois, which was a fantastic place for me. I spent, you know, 13 very productive years there, great colleagues and so on there is no medical school in Urbana. So we had been doing pretty well collaborating with med schools at different universities, uh, you know, in Washington, in, you know, St. Louis and, um, and Penn. We, we continue to work with the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, you know, med medical school and so on. But, but I think we perceived greater opportunities being geographically co-located, you know, with, with an active uh, medical school with, with researchers there. So, so that was kind of the main motivation. And, um, you know, the move to Northwestern has really blown out, you know, the number of, uh, you know, interactions that we have with, with clinicians. And I think for us, a lot of this re research, it's great to publish papers and do the, you know, uh, educate the graduate students and so on. But I think we're defining success by proliferation of the technologies in a broader sense. And, and we need to push that. And, and the best, most effective way to do it is to, to get engaged very, very intimately with, with a medical school. So, so we have all kinds of uh, human subject studies uh, underway. As you mentioned, we have devices in the NICU, in the PICU, in the ICU. We also have a number of engagements with the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, now called the Ability Lab. There's tremendous opportunities there, Parkinson's patients, patients uh, undergoing rehab from stroke, or studying aphasia, dysphagia, all kinds of stuff. Really just bandwidth limited by the numbers of students that we have, have in the group. I mean, I think the poll exceeds you know, our ability oh, to kind of respond what, to that. What, what so. is so striking, if you see a picture uh, of a, a newborn with all the wires attached with everywhere in the head, all over the body, the wired world, and then you see you know, two of your skin chips on the chest and the foot, and you yeah. say, Oh my gosh, this is a whole new world, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's actually really uh, uh, extraordinary. And th th these are the sorts of uh, developments that will make ICUs and hospitals look unrecognizable, you know, using the, the, this kind of modern capability of monitoring, right? Well, we hope so. You know, yeah. that, that's what we're aiming for. And uh, I think that NICU use case was, was a pretty compelling one where the skin-like form factor is absolutely essential. It's not just a convenience, right? It well, yeah, really like you say, you, when you take these off, you, 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 you hiss the skin right. in, in infants right. and particularly yeah. sick ones. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, the idea that you can do this the way you've invented is, yeah. is just remarkable. And I love seeing the monitors yeah. with all the data that yeah, yeah. you couldn't even get from the old world, so. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that's really the frontier is right now we're sort of focusing on reproducing the clinical tools that are used today 
but making the devices much less invasive in terms of the tape-based interface to the skin and the heavy, you know, cumbersome wires and so on. But, but I think once you have a foothold, once you reproduce what's being done now, the ability to extend beyond, right, and do all kinds of measurements that aren't even possible right now. So we can measure cardiac auscultation, for example, it's not done in the right, today. Right, right, exactly. We can also measure pulse arrival times, so we can get blood pressure continuously not done yeah. today, right? All, all kinds of opportunities. So that, that's kind of where we're looking, you know, in terms of the future research opportunities. Well, you've touched on when you went to Northwestern, it gave you a much better opportunity to liaise with uh, the medical community, I mean, directly, right. not through right. remote collaborations. Right. But why, what's holding back this engineering medicine coalescence? We need it to advance the field. You're the, right. you're the exemplar. Well, why do you right. think it doesn't happen more often? Well, hard for me to say exactly. I mean, I can say, you know, from, from my own personal experience, it's it's the translational engineering parts that, that tend to be difficult to do kind of in an academic setting. Um, there are relatively few funding streams that allow you to you know, take what is developed science, sort of foundational science from an academic setting into meaningful human deployments mm. in, in a clinical trial. Mm. That, that's a tricky I business. See. We have uh, had the good fortune that there's been engagement uh, you know, at the philanthropy level that help us to kind of solve that problem. Uh, but but that's not a scalable model, perhaps, right? To to get a larger fraction of the engineering community engaged in this kind of thing. So right. so I think there there are opportunities for foundations or maybe the federal fund, funding agencies to kind of look at this and and uh, think about whether it's useful to kind of place bets on on that style of research. It's not fundamental science discovery, but it's an important piece because in order to get things out of the lab, you have have to do these things, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think the results of that kind of work provide deep and important insights into guiding the scientific questions uh, and, and the basic research. So I think it's an, an important piece and um, you know, absent you know, funding specifically for that, it means you have to look for philanthropy, it means you have to start up companies and raise venture capital uh, you know, resources and, and it's time consuming, it, it's slow, it's not, not particularly efficient. So I think there's, there's that aspect of the funding landscape that, that could really accelerate a lot of the work in this space. Yeah. One of the, as I think I mentioned to you, one of the things that I found most uh, 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 of interest about you was that you're one of the few engineers that have been, ever had a profile in the New Yorker. <laughs> and uh, back a few years, there was the Body Electric. And mm -hmm. uh, tell us what it was like to hang out with a New Yorker a journalist to to be uh, embedded in you, with you in your lab? Well, it was interesting, it was a great experience. It was a little nerve wracking, <laughs> to, uh, to be honest with you, um, because she was, um, you know, she spent two full days with me, morning to, to night, sort of shadowing me as I you know, went about my business. And uh, you, could, you know, she was trying to collect as much information as she possibly could to, to write the piece, right? Yeah. And so I put a fair amount of thought and uh, advanced preparation uh, in, into that so that, uh, you know, the, the meetings were such that she was able to, to, get, to kind of get the insights that, that she needed to, to write the article. But, but you never know how those things are going to turn out, right? Oh, so it, was, it was a it, stunner. It and turned I, out pretty well. He's a little yeah. bit nervous. I didn't even read it myself <laughs> until several months later. He just didn't, didn't want to look at well, it. But, I, I, but a lot of people have seen it. It's, well, it's I an hope amazing uh, thing. the, the yeah. Medscape community, those who are interested in this, will take the time to read it because it really tells a lot about you. And, you know, it doesn't even mention the things that, you've been recognized, like, for example, the MacArthur Genius mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. MIT mm -hmm. uh, Lemelson mm -hmm. uh, Award or the mm -hmm. Smithsonian Ingenuity, mm -hmm. all these things that, you know, the National Academy, of course, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you have done, you've been rocking. I mean, you've been really changing the field. And uh, there are not so many pioneers have taken engineering to medicine as you in a very distinct way. Um, the other area that is, of course, a hot one right now is optogenetics, yeah. and I wouldn't be surprised if you're well into that too. Is that right? We're pretty deep into that. <laughs> yeah. So, so we had a paper in 2013 in Science where we um, sort of leveraged our ability to make very tiny, very thin semiconductor devices. I mean, that's kind of foundational for the skin integrated devices. A lot of what we do, uh, but those same ideas apply to LEDs, so so light sources. And the, and the conventional way to do optogenetic studies, at least of ro rodent uh, animal models, is to use fiber optic cables developed by the telecommunication industry to deliver light to targeted regions of the deep brain. And that sort of works. The problem is it physically tethers the animal to an external light source. And so that physical tether 
has impacts on the natural behavior patterns of the animals and it prevents the study of social interactions because two animals with fiber optic tether immediately get tangled up with one another. And so we begin to think about whether we could take these very tiny LEDs and just inject them directly into the brain, get rid of the external light source, get rid of the fiber optic cable, wirelessly deliver power to these LEDs down in the uh, region of the brain of interest and do optogenetics in that way. Wow. And it turned out to work. It's, a, it's amazing that you can sort of do the thermal management at such a level that you don't um, you know, damage the, 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 the neurons that you're trying to stimulate with, with the light and uh, it, it becomes enabling. So we actually started a small company around that technology. It's really a lot of inbound interest uh, for access to the, to the technology. We started a company, we uh, launched products at last year's Society for Neuroscience uh, uh, meeting and I think we probably have 30 systems worldwide now, oh my gosh. basically RF yeah. uh, control box, the software interface, yeah. and then tiny implants that implant completely so that so they they provide an ability to inject LEDs down to, into the deep regions of the brain, and then the wireless harvester sits subdermally. So the mice with these LEDs in their brains look exactly like a mouse that has not been you know modified in that way. So a little mice well, running around with uh, you know flashing uh, LEDs in their brains. It, has, it, works really it well. has some scary potential. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, you could see it for deep brain stimulation yeah. uh, and well, as a replacement. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah. wouldn't have to do what right today, yeah. uh, which is like a pacemaker for the brain, all kinds of hardware. Sure. And of course, as a research tool, it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's quite remarkable. Yeah. What other uh, areas, as you go forward, do you see? That, you know, the challenges, but also the big potential. Yeah, well, we're excited about this area of transient electronics. You referred to it a few minutes ago, this idea of building electronic systems entirely out of constituent materials that are water-soluble, right, to biocompatible end products. And so the notion of a medicine, then, that's engineered around electronics that dissolve in the body is pretty, pretty attractive to us. So as an example, we have active programs in electrical stimulators that interface with damaged peripheral nerves and completely implant into the body. You can wirelessly then deliver electrical um, pulses to, to the nerve in a way that accelerates the rates of neuroregeneration. So you can accelerate mm -hmm. healing in that way. And in that kind of context, you'd like a device that's ultimately bioresorbable because you don't need the device around once the nerve is healed. And so being able to build those systems out of purely bioresorbable materials becomes interesting as sort of an electronic neuroregenerative medicine in a sense. Yeah. And so I think that kind of system, implantable devices that operate in that way, perhaps in the future coupled to a sensing modality that allows a closed feedback loop type type operation is something that, that we think is an important future. So we, we have a lot of research efforts in, in that direction. No, it's clear that you're moving beyond the sensing capability to the actual right. treatment. Right, yeah. It's pretty yeah. formidable. Mm -hmm. Well, you are... <laughs> You're amazing, mm -hmm. and I, I just think you know how, how young you are and how much a future impact you and your group uh, and collaborators are going to have. So uh, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us, John. I yeah. want to wish you uh, and all the folks uh, at Northwestern um, continued, you know, remark just phenomenal success. So thanks mm -hmm. uh, to all of you at Medscape for joining us for this fascinating session, the, the bringing together of engineering and medicine. Uh, with one of our leading minds, and we look forward to bringing you more interesting folks like uh, Dr. John Rogers. Thank you. Thank you.